Thank you. So welcome again back to our second session of karma, about karma. And find a comfortable posture for your body. Making sure the spine is as extended as possible. <clears throat> Lightly closing the eyes and beginning to deepen your respiration. And again, as you do this, begin to scan from the top of your head all the way down, all the way down through your body. Noting if you're holding any tension, perhaps in your neck and shoulders, or the forehead or jaw, back, or lower back, places we tend to store tension. Letting that inhalation open up space in those tense areas as much as possible. With every exhalation, releasing some of that tension, bringing yourself to as comfortable a place as possible. Just take a couple of minutes. And let's consider our motivation again. So we're at the beginning of our day, earlier in the day, even some of us may have gotten up much earlier, but we have our time together to explore karma. It's a great thing to do and all the other activities of your day. So rather than having your distractions pull your energy, your awareness away, setting this motivation, it's like an anchor, you're directing you're in charge. How do you want your mindset to be? And directing your mind in the most positive way. And in our tradition, we're also thinking of all living beings, all living beings as much as possible. How can we help them as much as possible? What if we become enlightened? Credible, vast, spacious, omniscient mind from that place, knowing every moment how to manifest yourself perfectly. So feel free if you'd like to include that idea in your motivation to become a Buddha, to benefit all. Take a moment right now to set that motivation. And going back to the four characteristics of karma briefly from last night, it's just review. This is us just reflecting more deeply. Karma is definite. 
Karma is definite. So if we are doing something negative, thinking something negative, saying something negative, the only result is suffering for us in the future. The only result is a negative imprint in our mind, in our consciousness. Just reflect on that more deeply. Think about the positive activities you do. Positive activities of body, speech, and mind. Definitely layer happiness for you. Tibetan Buddhism says there's no other way this works. Bad deed gets you suffering. Good deed gets you happiness. Think about your responsibility we talked about last night. Can we accept that we have made mistakes and done some negative things? That's normal for a human. So it's not about beating yourself up. Far from it. It is not about beating yourself up. This is a path that includes self-compassion. Especially Westerners, we're so hard on ourselves. So it's just waking up to realize I blew it. I made a mistake. Sometimes we really blow it. Sometimes they're little mistakes. Can I learn from that? We can always apologize. We can always do a remedy and then some sort of perhaps spiritual antidote by doing a practice like Vajrasattva that helps clean up the mess that we made. Clean it up, but from a positive energetic space how would you like to take responsibility? Just reflect on that for a moment. And the second principle, karma is dynamic. It expands. So one tiny good deed right now that you think doesn't matter, and with the right conditions, in a sense, the right watering of it, treatment of the soil, the sunlight, like you're planting a seed, that can ripen into some incredibly wonderful event for you in the future. Just reflect on that. The same with negative karma. Our third characteristic, karma is specific. Karma specific. We won't experience the result of something we haven't created the cause for. We don't take on other people's karma. It's your specific karma. Your own, as they say, as Robert Thurman said, spiritual DNA. Got your own makeup of it. You can notice this through, if any of you have children, that the children are not necessarily alike. If you have siblings, 
Sometimes you're very different from your siblings, even though you're born from the same parents, because you have your own karmic makeup. Just reflect on that. And lastly, karma is dormant. The fourth characteristic, karma is dormant. The imprints we make, they're never lost over time. They will come to fruition. They will ripen when the right causes and conditions occur. So if you think you're gonna do something negative and not, and you know that you'll get away with it, eventually the right conditions, unless you purify first, will come to fruition. If you've done a lot of good things and you're not feeling the result, they will come to fruition when the right conditions come together. Could be this life, could be future lives. So if you can right now, just make a determination because sometimes we get a bit overwhelmed that we've done all these negative things and we focus on that. So again, we can purify anything and just make a little determination in your mind. You're gonna work on some purification as soon as you can, right? And to just be more careful with negative tendencies of body, speech, and mind and to continue enhancing all of your positive qualities that you have many you have many so just make a determination in your mind for a moment and please relax and when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. So when I mentioned as well, just now, you have many positive qualities. Some of you may have heard this. Um, I, some of us are new to each other. You haven't met me before. Some of us have been in classes before where you may have heard me talk about in a simple meditation, we were reflecting a little bit yesterday on the positive circumstances of your life. But because uh, I tend to do an unconventional meditation on precious human rebirth. And part of it, the next level I go to, which I didn't mention yesterday, was focusing on your positive qualities. Positive qualities. This is harder for people. Um, we feel embarrassed. We feel it's egotistical. It's, I'm talking about in a balanced way. And what happens is it, it seems like so many Westerners now are so focused on everything they do wrong. It's extraordinary, like so much focused and you'll spend a month ruminating over one small mistake you made. But then when your boss compliments you on a good project, you don't hear it, can't hear it. So that's the same device as being an egotist when you cannot hear and realize some positive qualities about yourself. And we all have many positive qualities. So it's, it's important to spend some time, especially if you really 
I've had people say to me, I don't have any positive qualities. They'll say simply not true. So if you're in there, spend a little time and you might want to jot down and it, and it could be something where you like to take people out for a meal now and then, or cook people a meal, or you bought somebody flowers. Maybe you're a dutiful son or daughter, you know, maybe you take care of animals really, really well. There's, you could go on and on that you're kind to people. Maybe you drive really respectfully, you know, or you look in the market and you look at the cashier, the person checking and you make eye contact and ask them how they're doing. I think there's so many qualities we have and we, we just kind of toss them out. And then as soon as you make one mistake, you're all over it. So again, we need to rebalance. We need to rebalance. It helps us engage and participate more in our karma in a healthy way in a healthy way not kind of like i've done so many wrong things i'm giving this up i can't manage can't do this <clears throat> so the other thing that comes from that level of self-compassion that you do by recognizing your qualities is again with karma we also don't want to blame the victim we don't want to blame somebody when somebody something really awful has happened to them. So once I've got my balance in my mind, I'm in a healthier place so I can kind of see a broader perspective. So what happens sometimes is something awful happens to someone else. And if you're in a Buddhist community, I've heard people say, oh, really great purification. But it has to be appropriate when you say that. And I know that um, one of the retreat centers I was working at, if we hired someone in the summer, the redwood trees, it was beautiful and they'd go to the beach and, and then the autumn would come, which was nice, but then the winter would come and that's when it would rain. And it gets very dark and the trees are dripping all the time and it's muddy and just driving in or out was, and so I'd see new staff people in their minds just, and then they get a cold because it's not great to live around redwood trees in the winter and you know and then they'd start feeling sick and then they suddenly didn't want to be and you know and then i'd hear a staff member say really good purification so you need to manage your mind to engage with someone else of when they're suffering so we know as buddhists again not everyone believes in karma but generally as buddhists we have a belief in cause and effect and if somebody has a terrible accident somebody loses a partner and um, we're not going to come in with this really great purification for you when somebody's suffering. So it's not that they're a victim, like, like when we have something negative happen. It's just, this is something unfolding from a seed in their consciousness. It's just kind of like a, a fact of life. You know, this is what happens. So we best, we want to best support them however we can. And so again, while everything that happens to us is karmically definite, Okay, it doesn't mean that you have an attitude of like, oh, well, they deserve it, you know, to say all the Jews in the Holocaust and all the other people that died in the Holocaust. Well, that's their fault. That's what they get, you know, no, terrible, terrible suffering, but obviously they had some kind of collective karma as well. All those people to suffer together under these atrocities, some karmic seed got caused in their consciousness, past lives that they did. They could have been in an army attacking another group of people like that. So again, all we want to do right now is just be more and more careful from this present moment onward. How do we proceed as kindly, compassionately, harmoniously with ourselves? So don't forget, don't leave yourself out with others, with our communities, okay, with the planet. The more we live in harmony like that, then we don't really have to worry. That's all we, and we can only do our best. So if you don't have knowledge of something, then learn, you know, you can't beat yourself up if you didn't know. For me, killing all those insects as a kid, vacuuming the porch, I didn't know the killing was a bad thing. I know killing a human was a bad thing. You know, kill, killing certain things was a bad thing. But, and again, obeying my parents as I got into Dharma and learned. And then the thing is you need to check up again. So when I heard about killing insects, I was a little freaked out. <laughs> And then you get into this mode, I'm not interested in Buddhism then. That's, you know, but so then I was at Copan doing this first course. I went back down to Kathmandu after the course, was in a little cheap little guest room, you know, guest house. 
And I then remembered the killing thing about insects. And, you know, in Kathmandu at that time, lots of insects in your room, spiders and things. And so I said, well, I'll, I'll try it for a day, not killing insects. You know, it's easier to kill them. I'll try it for a day. And I learned how to kind of usher the spider out of the room with the broom and how to catch things and release them outside. I had a cup I could. So I, I just did it for one day. I said, I'll do it for a day. And then you have to assess how you feel. So I checked at the end how I felt. I felt pretty good. I felt actually happy to see this spider kind of scamper off into its life. And, you know, it has every reason to live just like I do. What if somebody came and stuck their foot on me? Suddenly not a great thing. So I was kind of, so I decided I'll do it for another day. Just see how it goes. And, and then another day and another day and another day. And I never stopped doing it. So you have to check yourself. Does it work for you? And people talk with me about, I have ants in my kitchen, they'll say, cockroaches. Or it's easier to kill them, but it doesn't mean they go away, right? That's not how they, how they really go away. So, so it's, it's, it's your own individual experience, how you want to proceed. And again, in general, think about it. We want it. We must, we really want to be compassionate as much as we can at all times. We want to help alleviate suffering. Okay. We want to at least attempt to feel a degree of compassion for somebody suffering. And here's the bigger, bigger space that's hard. The perpetrators, the perpetrators, the terrorists, the bombers, the mass shooters, the, the killers, the murderers, you know, this is really hard for us. You know, you might even say, well, the Taliban, what they're doing to women and what they're doing to their country, you know, so if we hate them and we direct some hostility towards them and say, oh, they're crazy like that, then it plants little negative seed in our mind of that negative mind state, you know, hatred, negative mind state. We're going to go into that in a minute. Hate, hatred is a negative mind state. So that gets planted in my mind. They don't know that I hate them. So, so the more I can think, because think about the suffering they're causing themselves. Think about what they're planting in their mind streams. In the future lives, perhaps another life not being free, not being free because they subjected others to a lack of freedom. That. So that's a bigger space that we get to, okay? But just think about, again, what they are storing up of appallingly bad karma for themselves in the future. This is difficult. So this special and considered compassion doesn't mean you ignore the fact that, that they're doing horrible things. You know, it is horrible like that, but I don't need to junk my mind up with, I hate them, I hate them, I hate them, where you're off balance and anxious, angry, then it plants more seeds of that in your consciousness. So when, once you understand the principle of karma a little bit more, you know, you, you kind of see the suffering differently. You kind of see the suffering differently. And I have to say, it then makes me more peaceful to let go, to realize. And the reason, if I look at the Taliban, if I look at stuff going on in the United States, here, at, all over the world, Russia and the Ukraine, what's going on, you know, you understand that we, I'm in a world system and there is fragmentation and hostility. And, and why? Because people don't understand emptiness. They, they're, they're misknowing everything, K-N-O-W. So in a sense, we're like children. And it's not that we're like children because we have maturity, but when we really lack that view, lacking the correct view that we are all interdependent, all interrelated, right? It's very tricky. It's very hard to kind of calm down when somebody bashes, like hits your car or something to just relax, to realize it's not my car, it's the car you drive. See, it's different. My car, I'm all invested, hanging on, clutching, grasping, seeing the car as a solidly existent thing. But what about the car I drive? I know it's the same car, but each thing I try to, you know, this is the cup I use. This is the, the room in which I stay. This is so there's a little less investment of ownership, mine, that keeps us separated, right? Because anything that you interfere with my agenda, then I get upset. So once we understand that and realize people suffer 
because of mis their misknowledge of reality, misunderstanding of reality. So then your compassion can grow, become universal, unconditional, like that. Karmic responsibility, we talked a little bit about this last night. Um, responsible, what you want to try to do is develop responsible precautions um, that you also, you're not tempted out of ignorance, that you're not tempting others out of ignorance. Like if you know somebody has a certain tendency, that's part of our responsibility. You know, so for instance, if you know somebody has a terrible temper, I'm not going to persuade them to get involved in a situation <clears throat> that I know is just going to arouse that anger in them. So you can protect other people. Again, they have their own karma. But again, and so sometimes, and here's the thing, <clears throat> can you deflect your own anger at times if you're in a confrontation with someone? You know, and what happens is we might be saying, oh, I don't want to get angry because of my own mind. I don't want to create, I know anger is not good. So not only do I not want to show them anger and be angry at them, it makes me a little, makes me look like I'm out of control. But rather than caring about what you look like, a bigger expression is what if you don't want to get angry because you're concerned about throwing oil on the fire that this other person may get angry back? It's a huge space of mind in your anger, in your conflict with them to suddenly think about them and their mind. So it helps you diffuse your anger, helps you bring your anger down. Okay? Again, this is a path about helping all living beings. But in the same thing, protect your own mind. Protect your own mind. That if you know that when I'm with these people, um, I'm a bit off balance, I get rattled, I feel intimidated. Um, so I'm gonna limit the time I'm with them and then I say the wrong things and that's not really me. Or when I'm with this person in this work situation, I have a tendency to really get angry at the way they're managing. So maybe instead of having to lead the discussion, I can just sit back and let the others discuss, you know, or limit the time, shift something you can at work that, you know, puts you in a better situation. So, you know, be skillful. And I mentioned to be skillful with what you're reading, what you're watching, what social media you engage with, what you do on your computer. These things come in and condition. And they're designed to kind of get some sensational responses from us. We can be better than that. Balance your mind. Some meditation practice, great. And then reflect on karma. And think about what am I engaging? What seeds am I planting? Like that. So again, life, you can't really make life safe. But through this protection, you can't really make life safe. I'm sorry, this is samsara. So you never know what will happen. I mean, something could fall on this house right now and bash my head and that could be it. You, you just don't know. However, you can make your life, your mind safe. You can make your mind safe. Again, that's protecting your mind from certain situations, certain situations. So, and one example I give is some years ago, um, two people in my family that I love dearly. It's a father and a son that I love dearly that I'm very close with. Um, I had moved back to their area where my family is from. And I hadn't lived around there in years. So I come back in and there's a, there's a dynamic in my family that wasn't all that healthy. And the men would talk and kind of dominate conversations over dinner and things. And the women would just sit there and be, and if they said something, they were kind of ignored and so this father and son pair one day invited me out for an afternoon with them. They wanted to do something and and I went out and then the whole day they ignored me and they just talked about people I didn't know and never brought me into the conversation. And it just kind of went on and on and on. And I was like amazed. And and the younger one was kind of telling these racist, sexist jokes that the older one was laughing at that I know he didn't agree with. And I was watching the scene unfold of like, what's happening to these people there, you know, so it kind of went on and then they'd invite me out again. And I a couple times turned it down. And then one last time, the older person said to me privately, um, you never want to come out with us anymore. You know, and, and so what I could do is I 
if it was just the two of them, I would ask who's going just the two of them. And then what I would do is drive myself to meet them just for lunch instead of the whole afternoon. I said, Oh, why don't I meet you for lunch? Cause that I could handle like an hour, hour and a half. And then I could just leave when I wanted rather than being in the same car with them for five hours. And, and so finally it kind of went on and, and then I brought up to the older person what I was experiencing. Okay. There was immediate denial from his side. We don't do that. We're not like, that. but then somehow he started hearing it from other people at some of the women in the family and, and slowly the dynamic through his talking to the younger person, the dy dynamic shifted a bit. So again, me protecting my mind was, I didn't really feel comfortable to go into that space with them because my mind would get negative. I'd get angry at them. You know, I might say something snippy slowly. Right. So again, and when it's appropriate, only over time was I able to express something slowly, privately, you know, in a very gentle way to suggest. And at first he got defensive and then later he came back to me and said, yeah, you know, I realize. So slowly, slowly we try to help things along when we can. Sometimes we can't. Sometimes we can't. <clears throat> so karmic imprints again just considering have been produced in large numbers since beginningless time for our mind that's us karmic imprints have been produced in huge numbers some are heavier some are lighter okay it's a powerful unpredictable mixture okay and given this fundamental ignorance as i mentioned this misknowing since beginningless time and insecurity about our karma the purpose of buddhist practice and many other spiritual paths is to fortify ourselves against the uncertainty of life. Okay, so basically make your mind stronger so that whatever comes, your mind's flexible and you can deal. That's what we're doing on this path. And that's what's brilliant because you can fix your mind. You're at the controls. There's not a separate being doing it to you. There's not a separate being that's deciding if you're going to live or die or you can get your mind open for any situation and be flexible. And then you're much, much happier, much happier. <clears throat> so um, I want to talk about skillful, unskillful karma. Um, Karma is both the intention and the action. The intention and the act. Karma is thought. People say our thoughts, do they generate karma? In the Tibetan tradition, they say, yes, they do. And intention and action both depend on our state of mind, which we labeled either positive, negative, virtuous, non-virtuous, like that. <clears throat> and so, you know, if you get to um, significant lo jong practice, lo jong, lo mind, jong transformation, training the mind. Very, very beautiful practices. Lama Zopram Shi talks about lo jong in many books, and one famous one is Transforming Problems into Happiness. Many of you probably read the book, Transforming Problems into Happiness. I teach a lot of lo jong classes. I love teaching lo jong. Um, and he says that. You get to the, the thought of liking problems, welcoming problems, as if the thought of ice cream or pizza, like, like that, you know, and why is that? And people say, are you kidding me? Right. So if you stop believing in labels we habitually attach to everything, okay, you can be far more flexible in coping with situations, okay? We have to be very careful with how we're labeling things. This relates to emptiness, of course. Okay. So in order to help us study and understand karma, um, you, we decide at this point to apply certain labels, you know, but the labels are really arbitrary. They're relative. There's a relative um, reality going on. And so if you want a, a certain type of result, think about it this way. We need to make sure that we don't produce that type of cause and in this way bearing in the back of our mind our categories are merely labels and we look at different types of karma so again if you want to um if you don't want a certain type of result 
Um, you want to make sure I'm not producing the cause. Now, granted, we won't know specifically well, what is the cause for that and what is, you know, but one of the things that happened for us in a community at Vajrapani years ago, Vajrapani is a retreat center in the Redwoods in California, located um, a mile or so, half a mile down a dirt gravel, narrow mountain road with tremendous slopes off the side that go into a creek and landslides and they're getting a lot of rain right now so it's probably a little bit intense there and I lived there for many years and a lot of us didn't like the road so we were told actually what creates a rough road if you don't like the road some some of our neighbors liked the road and the reason was they were living a very backwoods life and they didn't want people coming down the road nosing into their business so they liked having a difficult road but we didn't because we had a retreat center and our members and our guests didn't like the road. They were worried about their cars. They were scared to drive the road and on and on. So we finally were looked at what creates a rough road and ex experienced that it came from harsh speech, negative speech. We're gonna talk about that in a minute, the 10 non-virtues. Harsh speech is one of them. And this is about yelling at people, talking about people behind their back, saying negative things about people and our community 15 of us living there half of which were staff were good people really good people but we were a bit sloppy in our speech and we had little you know nee, 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 over here talking about her and a little bit over here talking about him and you know back and forth as any community people have so the community together was struggling with some things and we finally said we agreed, let's do something about it. We were all interested. Most of us were interested in doing something about it. And there was one guy in the community that always was the black sheep and people were yelling, you know, blaming him for this. And he was angry at everybody else. And so we brought in a Buddhist psychologist who lived near us, who agreed to do the work. And we met, believe it or not, for four years, um, every four to six weeks. And whoever lived on the property could attend. You know, and it was hard work at times. People were on the hot seat. And, but what we did is we got really clean with our speech. We cleaned up our speech and decided we were not going to be trashing each other with our speech anymore. We actually gave each other permission that if we started to go down that road, somebody would say, I'm not comfortable with what you're talking about. Can we talk about something else? And, and then we had somebody come from the county who did $250,000, I'm not kidding, worth of work on our road, unsolicited during this process, halfway through this process. So again, you don't necessarily know what causes, you, but you try to understand when we heard about a rough road, then all of us got really clear. Like every time we started some negative with speech, many of us learned to catch ourselves and go, oh, I don't want that. I don't want to deal with the rough road anymore. And it made it rough and bumpy in our community as well. Dukkha, dukkha, which is the opposite of sukha in Sanskrit. Dukkha is suffering. Sukha bliss, bliss. Dukkha technically literally means bumpy axle. It's a rough ride, suffering. So it just corresponded right there to the rough road. And then we realized, let's clean up our speech. So understanding karma and modifying our actions is critical, critical in making sure that we once again have the chance that we could get into the human realm, that we can get into a human realm that meets the Dharma, that you meet a teacher early in life like that. So let me talk about um, the 10 non-virtues. Let's talk about this. I think most of you are familiar with these. We avoid 10 non-virtues, and I like to say we practice 10 ethical guidelines. So sometimes called the 10 virtues, 10 ethical guidelines that relate to your body, speech, and mind. Body, speech, and mind. So the three of them relate to your body, four are things we avoid with our speech, and three are things we do with our mind. The three we avoid with our body, and how many of you know these? I think some of you know these. What do you avoid with your body, starting with number one? 
what's the main thing in Buddhism we killing. ask? <clears throat> killing? Killing. We avoid killing. And it also includes harming others. We avoid harming others. Number one. Number two? It's sexual misconduct, or that's number three? That's number three. That's number three. What's number two? Dealing. What do you remember? What's that? Stealing. Stealing. Thank you. Stealing. We avoid stealing. And here, here's, let me give it to you in a different way as well. Taking what is not offered and borrowing without asking. So I'm going to go into these a little bit more. Number three, sexual misconduct, which is basically about adultery or interfering with two people in an intimate relationship and breaking them up. Okay. Usually through sex, sexual involvement. Okay. St uh, we avoid killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. Four that are related to speech. Four things we do with speech. They are in order of heaviness. Number one, anybody remember? No lying. Lying. We avoid lying. Uh, speaking, um, you know, speaking what is the opposite of the truth. Number two, we avoid. People always get these mixed up. We avoid divisive speech. So if you're in an office, you're talking about people behind their back, you're saying things that, that create disunion. Number three, harsh speech we avoid. Number four, the lightest of the speech is gossip. We avoid gossiping or idle chatter or meaningless speech. Okay, it's the lightest, but the problem with gossip is we do it all the time. Three that are related to our mind. Three related to the mind. Covetousness we avoid, which is a greedy mindset. Anybody remember the last two? Is one of them holding wrong views? Holding wrong views is the tenth. Thank you. Holding wrong views is the tenth. The ninth is harmful intent. Harmful intent, wishing others ill in your mind, like that. So let's talk about these. So the ethical conduct of, of opposed to killing is saving lives, respecting life very much, whether it's an insect, whether it's a human. I mean, even I find if you're disrespectful to somebody, it kind of goes against the grain of, you know, being nice to somebody. It's like harming someone when you're disrespectful. So sometimes we get into both of them. It's like the body doing something, the mind doing something, the speech doing something. So think about, you know, and you, so here's where people also sometimes want my permission to kill the ants in their kitchen. I can't give you that permission, sorry. It's an individual choice. And I do know Buddhists that have had their houses exterminated. Um, it's interesting now for me in the States, I don't know if they do this in England, but if somebody has a termite problem or some sort of insect infestation in their house, when I was a child, we had a tick, can you believe it? If you're familiar with ticks, we had a tick infestation in our house. They were coming out of the walls. Why? They got brought in by my dog and somehow they, and it, and it was, it was like a horror movie. Um, we didn't have the house fumigated. I don't remember what we did, but we got them out of the dog for sure. But people, what they do in the States is they put a tent over the house and you have to move out of the house, get your pets out. Some people have to like take dishes out and the whole house is fumigated with some kind of poison to kill all the insects. So here's the thing is that doesn't necessarily kill the insects. It kills them temporarily. And for me, when I see those houses and I drive by them, it's like a gas chamber. I'm like, oh, like so much um, designed over years of not killing that now I find it really rattling to see that. Again, you do the best you can because termites do destroy houses. So, but people do pujas to rid their houses of insects. And I do know in many cases, it's worked better. They actually got rid of the insects permanently. So it, again, it's an individual choice, what you believe, things like that. But just your basic kitchen, we've had this at center. So get creative. It takes a little bit more time to get that value of sanctifying life. And what we do is we'd get a soft brush. We brush the ants into a dust, dustbin very carefully while they're living, take them outside, and then we bleach the counters down. And we, and at one point we had to do it every single night, but that kept 
and then the ants relocate and find a different sometimes we put a food source for them outside so they go to that food source big put a little pot of honey outside they'll go there instead of your kitchen make sure the kitchen's clean make sure the boxes are all closed up there's things that we just have to do to try to protect their lives to keep them out of our spaces and i could go on and on with insects because i've had many experiences of saving insects um stealing now here's what happens with stealing is um we we don't we're not going to go out and steal a car okay but you know you're at the gym and somebody left their conditioner on the bench you forgot yours and you just decide you're going to use some of theirs but you didn't ask them and so another thing is if you're visiting a friend overnight visiting a relative you're spending the night what people do if they come to where i'm staying i just will stand in the middle of the kitchen and say help yourself to any anything you need in the house anything you need in the bathroom just help yourself that way they if they need something they can just go and take it rather than them looking around taking something then they get into the some degree of stealing karma if they haven't asked so and i'm really careful if i'm at someone's house i will ask them even if you know they're going to say yes you can use my toothpaste i'll just say is it okay if i borrow some toothpaste then it's clean clear like that sexual misconduct as well so here's lesser degrees we get into the smaller things you may not have an affair with someone okay but if you know your partner doesn't like you flirting and you go to a party and you're flirting and and you, you're flirting where they can see you and you know it annoys them it's a little lesser degree of sexual misconduct let's look at the four with speech so lying we know and we'll and i'll talk about where these things get you as well what are the results of these things lying we know what that is so we avoid that try speaking the truth but here's the thing be gentle with speaking the truth people ask me about white lies you know where you're you're lying to someone because you're trying to protect them or you don't want to hurt them so i've found really creative ways not to do white lies anymore where i am telling the truth but not revealing to them what i don't want them to know if it's going to hurt them there are creative ways you can do that so so be skillful as you don't want to be blunt too direct where you blurt something out what was the truth when you know it's really going to divide people or hurt them or so this is all about i think we're pretty pretty um up on that in england of how to tactfully maneuver with your speech divisive speech is really difficult um it goes on in offices people have in families um just being you know saying negative things instigators if you know people that are instigators they do this they tell one person one thing did you know that he thinks that you are this and then tells the other person did you know she thinks that you're and then it creates a dissension between these two people like that some people have a quality of bringing people together with their speech you know people like that i'm sure where they have a way of balancing have a way of bringing things together it can be quite nice like that I was watching international news once with Rinpoche years ago, and we had a secretary of state in the United States named Colin Powell. Some of you may have remembered him. Unfortunately, he died of COVID. So sad. He was a really good person, and he was somebody that had the quality of um, bringing both sides of the Congress together. Like everybody respected him, and he had a very way that he could speak that just people felt to get you know together with him of kind of bridging gaps and i was watching the news and he came on and Rinpoche didn't you know saw him and said who who is this man who is this man so i explained who he was and then Rinpoche said he has the quality to bring people together with his speech it's really interesting and he did he did have that quality the next one is harsh speech where you're yelling at somebody cursing at somebody um, we know what that feels like, really, really negative. So we want to avoid that. And basically saying the opposite would be, ethical guideline would be saying things that um, sincerely complimenting somebody, saying something positive to someone, something gentle, something praising perhaps, but it has to be sincere. Otherwise it falls into lying. 
The fourth one is speech gossip, as I mentioned, speaking meaninglessly. Now, here's the thing people say to me, but when I go visit my family, you know, at the holidays, whatever, they're not Buddhists. So I can't talk about the Dharma all the time. You know, because people say speaking meaningfully is talking about the Dharma. Can't do that with people that aren't into, into Buddhism. So what you can do is just, you have your conversations, nothing wrong with that. And it, it could be that, and I've been with people that somebody very close to me, a family member was always very negative and critical about other people. So the few times I would get with them when I come and visit and we'd be sitting in the kitchen over a meal and they just start trashing one person after another, after another. So what I would do is thinking about them as well like i wouldn't engage in the negative speech but then i would offer something positive about the person and say yeah but she's always really nice to everybody like just to throw that in and then if they kept continuing on thinking about their minds what they're creating i would interrupt and say oh excuse me i just need to use the bathroom for a moment to try to interrupt the conversation so when i came back i would bring a new subject in and sometimes depending on the person I would just directly say, do you mind if we talk about something else? I'm kind of uncomfortable with the conversation. So whichever circumstance kind of suits best, then you can definitely interrupt like that and do something like that with um, the kind of idle chatter. Now, here's the thing about idle chatter as well, which we don't realize. So obviously we'd like to talk about the Dharma, but we can't talk about it all the time, is we don't think of this as gossip. But if you're going on and on and on about the last World Cup game and your favorite football team and and the people around you really aren't interested, um, or you're just going on with the whole, it's, that scene is meaningless speech as well. Because what it does is it just creates more imprints in our mind about the team and the sport. And, that, and when you're dying, is that what you want to be thinking about? Maybe it is. Okay. I'd rather be thinking about something a little bit more uplifting and but just notice again this is about noticing the imprints just about noticing the imprints one example i i give that happened to me i was living on the east coast of the states which is where i'm from the philadelphia area and i've been living there the last few years and i was helping my parents till they passed and um and just recently more have moved to california moved back to california so living on the East Coast in the Philadelphia area, there is an American football team, of course, that my family is really into and they watch the games and I've never cared for football, American football. It's very violent and I really have very little interest. But over the years being there on a Sunday, my brother's having, you know, everyone over the house. Well, I enjoy the family. So of course I'm gonna go and we're going to get together and have a meal and have pizza or it's fun hang out with my niece and nephew and my sister-in-law great it's great fun but but they're also watching the game so part of it and i understand american football so i'd watch the game and then you start feeling and then i my neighbors around me well the eagles are doing this now and the, that's the name of the team and they're doing this and they're they're doing this and so then finally they look like they're going to win one year win it all one year, a few years ago. I'm in Florida teaching. And I, the Philadelphians around me can't believe I'm not going to be in Philadelphia for this. Like, this is the, the pressure, as you know, right? pressure. And so I'm in Florida and suddenly I'm in Florida teaching, but I'm thinking about what time is the game on tomorrow? Like, when would I ever care about a football game? So you see on the minor little thing, how suddenly I'm interested and I need to watch this game, you know? which I ended up doing with another nun, making her watch it with me. It was her home, like, so, I mean, it was, it was a joke, actually. We watched about, I think we watched about half the game. Um, it was so funny, though. And she said, sure, I'll watch it with, like, just as a break. But I was thinking, so, you, so that was like a minor thing. But I thought, my goodness, I have to watch my mind with the imprints because slowly they seep in meaningless speech. Okay. Uh, Let's talk about the three with mind, covetousness, a greedy mind. Ethical guideline for this is, um, is thinking about wishing others well, offering to people, rejoicing at their good fortune, rejoicing at their good fortune. You know, Because what covetousness is, your neighbor got the fancy red sports car that you wanted, the electric car that you wanted, 
right? Be happy for them. Because as soon as you get the jealous mind, oh, I wanted that. How come they got it? How did, where did he get the money to get that car? How'd she buy that, right? So again, um, that creates more of that tiny little mind, you know, me, 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 I need, I, I want, I want, I want. You're going to have less based on that mind. If I rejoice, how fantastic, right? And the thing is, if you're not a natural rejoicer, I was not in years ago. Um, if you're not a natural rejoicer, you can practice. This is called practice, our spiritual path. We practice it. We rehearse it. So we get better at it. Absolutely. So I would, and I'd hear somebody's taking a holiday to Hawaii. So my initial rejoicing, you force it. Okay, you fake it until you become that. Fake it until you become that. So I would kind of learn about rejoicing and they, it's the easiest way for you to make merit, for you to make positive imprints like that. So I would kind of at least get my mouth in the position, even though I didn't feel it. And I'd be like, great. But slowly over time, great, like forcing and forcing. Now I hear somebody's going to Hawaii. I'm really there. I'm just like, fantastic. I'm so happy. Please enjoy. And I totally, my whole body's with it. So you, this is what practice does. Over and over, you have to keep, you know, putting yourself in some uncomfortable position. I don't feel normal doing this. And slowly it becomes automatic if you feel like that positive manifest, manifestation will help you. Harmful intent, the ninth one, ninth non-virtue. Harmful intent or malice is another word. The antidote, wishing others well. Wishing others well. Thinking positive thoughts about them, like that. Um, and then the last one, holding wrong views. Ideally, and ultimately, it's about getting a direct perception of emptiness. Getting a direct perception of emptiness. So along the way, you might say, well, I don't have that, so I'm always practicing that wrong view that negativity. That's why I do Vajrasafa practice every evening to just try to minimize, sweep away that situation where I am misknowing everything just from my fundamental ignorance, but I'm working on it. And all I can do is work on it my best, best way that I can. Okay. Which involves studying about emptiness, showing up at classes on emptiness, learning to meditate on emptiness effectively, doing the meditations regularly, and then in your break times, kind of poking at your reality at times, especially if you become unbalanced. If you're finding you get very angry suddenly at someone, you're very fearful of something. And you can ask yourself, what is really happening here? What's my mind showing me right now? First of all, if you're fearful or something, first protect yourself. Make sure you're safe. First protect yourself, of course. Protect your body and mind. But the second thing is when you can, either back in your meditation space, or if you can in the moment, what's going on? What, what's really happening that you're afraid of? What's your mind showing you right now? What's playing back? And it could just be that I am labeling, as we mentioned before, we have very concrete labels on things. Those labels solidify certain things about people and things. But if it's based on our ignorance, we're not seeing things clearly not seeing things clearly at all. Let me give you an example. So, and, and the way attachment and aversion work. I think I've talked about this in a past class in Leeds, perhaps. Um, what happens is when you see a person walking toward you, let me break it down to the raw data that is there, the raw information. If a person's walking towards you. So if the raw information is you've got an oblong fleshy thing on the top, that's their head. It's covered in a material called hair, usually, okay? There's two circles here, color, this, and then there's a hole here and sound comes out of the hole. So everybody with me? This is the basic of what's happening. There's a longer torso thing, usually covered in cloth. In my case, let's hope, okay? Four appendages, okay? The arms and legs, okay, four appendages. Here comes the person walking. Through. That's your valid basis of designation for to be merely be labeled person in your mind. That's your valid basis of designation. Oblong, fleshy thing, torso, four appendages. Okay, they're walking towards you. Suddenly you've got a negative karmic seed ripening. Why is it ripening all of a sudden? 
I have no idea. You, you need to be a Buddha to understand, but a negative karmic seed suddenly comes to fruition, ripens, right? Causes my mind to project onto them to underestimate the reality that is there. Simply a person is walking towards you. Simply a person. Now you underestimate the reality. And what that does causes your mind, this is the movie screen of your life, causes your mind to see all their faults and negativities. The next thing you know in your mind is activated. I don't like them. Or I'm anxious now. Oh no, here comes so-and-so. Oh my gosh, I don't like them. I hate this guy. Oh no, here comes this guy. Underestimating what's there. There's no concretely negative guy there or woman there at all. No concretely negative person there at all. Why? Because a concretely inherently existent negative person is like that for all time and all being. Inherent existence means they're frozen in time and space. They have no ability to change if it's inherently existent and it doesn't come from other things. Well, what is that? There isn't anything that exists like that, basically, okay? A person depends on their body and mind. A person depends on their parents having another child. It depends originally the body on the sperm and egg coming together. Nobody exists inherently like that, but we impute that on them, solid existence. Okay, then it fosters the misknowing. That's the misknowing. And then that fosters negative mind states in our mind. Okay, this is all negativity. This is all about anger, aversion, hatred. Okay, underestimation of what's out there just from a karmic seed of a previous moment of that in my mind. That's it, okay? Now here comes attachment. What attachment does is positive seed ripens suddenly in the mind, and I over embellish the reality that's out there. Over embellish. I'm not, again, seeing mere person. Okay? I over embellish and the most glorious Adonis, Adonis set, oh my God, beautiful eyes, the hair, the speech, the, um, and then the next thing I know is I need to have that. I need to have more of that. I want that person. I want more of them around me. I want to be near that person. I need to get to know the person. And then if you really get to an extreme, obsession comes, infatuation comes. These are not, this is not unconditional love. This is attachment, desire, boom. Hatred and attachment desire are two of the three poisons. And the third one is ignorance, fundamental ignorance. So again, ignorance in the wheel of life painting in the center of the three animals represented. And the, the wheel of life painting is the one with the demon that's holding the six realms of existence. And in the center is a circle, three animals. So you've got the pig with its mouth open, the real authentic ways they're not catching each other's tail. The pig has its mouth open. Pig is ignorant. Mouth is open. Out of the mouth come a rooster and a snake. The rooster is attachment, desire, and the snake is hatred, aversion, anger. So everything born out of ignorance like that. So now attachment, you're over embellishing. So these are imbalances in the mind, imbalances in the mind. So what you try to do is cultivate the right view. But here's another thing about the 10th non-virtue of wrong view is we have other wrong views. So for instance, in the 1920s, 30s, 40s maybe, people, cigarette smoking was fashionable. It was the rage. There was a whole industry of lighters and cigarette holders and cigarette cases and massive advertising cigarettes. Everybody smoked. Every all the movies, everybody was smoking every, you know, you could smoke anywhere. Then they realized that cigarette smoking is really hazardous to your health. And then it's wound down, especially in Western countries. Now it's really rare. Um, and uh, except when you when you go to France. <laughs> I, I was just recently visiting a friend in France and I was amazed coming from California where no one smokes cigarettes. In France, still walking down the street, how many people, how much cigarette smoke? I was like, woo. It's really now you go to California where everyone's smoking marijuana. It's legal. So you walk down the street and you smell that everywhere, you know, which, which still alarm. I was still, I'm still in shock about the legality of marijuana in California. So I'm still, and I'm like walked out of my supermarket the other day and um, get a few groceries and there's people just in the parking lot, just like, you know, I was like, you can, you know, you smell and you go and people just 
no problem. You just smoke and there's shops everywhere that sell it. If you can imagine. <laughs> so funny. So again, um, so if you're holding, if you're still holding a view that cigarette smoking is good for your health or it's great, that's holding a wrong view. So related to our philosophy, if you feel that um, I don't believe that I'm going to die in this body, I hear Buddhism talks about that. I don't believe it. You know, I think I'm going to live forever in this body. That's holding a wrong view. You know, if you have a part of the philosophy, if you're saying I don't believe in reincarnation, that's garbage. That's holding a wrong view as opposed to I'm not sure about reincarnation. Not really sure yet. I'm going to put it over here on the shelf. I'll revisit it later. I, I'm going to check these other things that I feel really strongly about. That's different. That's being discerning. And we would very much ask you to be discerning. You need to check up the philosophy. That's healthy. Okay. So those are the 10 non-virtues and the 10 ethical guidelines. I just want to ask any questions right now, and then we're going to go into um, the way they ripen and things. Any questions about what I'm saying? Please, Jenny. Yeah, you were talking about um, uh, the white lies. Uh, um, yeah? Yes. Um, no, that is not what I wanted to. You, you also said that uh, you found creative ways to talk um, positively to other people when you were not completely, um, uh, I don't know the English word, I'm sorry. No, but no, don't be sorry. Wanting to tell, like not wanting to hurt them. So yeah, that I might yeah. tell, so, I might tell a white lie. Well, I don't even know if the no, term white lie is best. Aren't but... you lying then in some form? Well, no, I, and I'll give an example if I can remember, because I remember thinking, okay, I actually did not lie. I didn't, it was something about, um, oh, I know what it was. Um, so recently I've had a friend that left an FPMT job to go off to take a, another job. And, you know, he just needed a break and he's amazing and he's done incredible work for years and years and years and got this other job offer and decided to take it and he told me and one other person and he said please don't tell anyone and i said no problem so recently a very close other friend of his came to me and said do you know where he is he's not at that center anymore i heard he left do you know where he is and do you know what he's doing and so i knew exactly where he was and I knew exactly what he was doing to some degree and so I thought for a moment and then I said you know um I can't I can't really tell you like like in in a meaning not that I wasn't going to tell them but or I think I said something like well all I can tell you is I think he's um I think he left the center so I kind of said it like that meaning very casual it wasn't that I wasn't going to tell her or that I knew but it's an expression in American, like all I all I could tell you is I think he left the center, which he did. So I wasn't lying because that was really all I could tell her. And um, but it's an expression that's kind of like meaning I don't really know. Like I don't have any more information, you know, so that was a way I kind of got out of that. Does that make sense? Again, this is slightly um, we might be getting hooked in the language versus English versus American. Does that make sense, Jenny? Yeah, it makes sense. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, because there's little ways you could just say, all I could tell you is, um, I think he left the center, you know, it's like that. And and just yeah. kind of casually so that she wasn't asking again and prying, like, do you know anymore? And because I did want to keep his confidence, you know, it's important. And I did. So like that. Thank you. Sure. Any other, any other? questions, comments. Looks like some, Louise, you've got a beautiful sunny day behind you. Looks great out there, out the windows. Okay, let me bring up, um, I'm gonna find my, um, 
chart here. Sorry, Amy. Uh, yeah. I, I, I have a question in a way around like, can you lie? Can Please. you lie by, by omission or is it depending on the intent? You know, you can actually sometimes lie by omission and you have to be careful. But again, those things may, based on having a very good intention, can be a lesser negative karma. But there are ways of, they say you can lie by omission. Mm. You could also lie by just not, like it's not speech, but you nod your head or you, and they say there's ways you can lie like that. It's implied, like you know, and you're, um, you're not saying anything. So all those, and just what we want to do is it's very tricky with speech and the way the mind works. So you just have to, you just have to try your best. I'd say yeah. you just have to try your best. It's not a perfect world. And sometimes you get, you know, somebody's in your face kind of suddenly and you're like, Oh, what do I say? You know, and, um, and you just try your best to avoid, you know, to avoid lying like that. Thank you. Hey, hang on one second. I just want to find my um Okay, the results. I want to talk about the results of Let me add a few other things about I'll come back to that. There's four results of non-virtuous karma. And, and so here's one thing, when you hear about the 10 non-virtues, three of body, four of speech, three of mind, um, don't freak yourself out. Try not to freak yourself out that, um, and, and obviously when I mention those, I'm sure two or three popped up for some of you right away. Like, you know the ones you're doing, you know the ones you get hooked by. Now, some people go, well, I have all 10, you know. Okay, well, we do. We do have all 10. But there's usually two or three that we're doing more so. So don't worry yourself about it. It's more about now you know. And can you look at the ones and go after the ones you do the most? Go after the ones, the biggest one you think you have. And just notice why do you think you do that? Why do you think you do it? Um, how do you feel after you do it? After you engage in the non-virtue? You know, can you just see the pattern of the non-virtue? You know, did, did you notice it was just a conditioned factor of your environment, your family, your friends, your partner, things like, and just see the habit of it. It's not blaming them. It's just kind of looking at how my mind engaged with those kind of things. Like when I looked at how my mind engaged with the influence of my family watching the American football game and how I suddenly just out of my camaraderie with them, wanting to be with them, which is very nice. I'm very close with my family, but then noting how it kind of seeped in where I'm suddenly interested and, and realizing, is that something I want to proceed with? Is it something I want to continue to engage with? Like now I'm not that interested, I'm away from it. So not, you know, it's out of my, it's more out of my mind and on and on like that. Um, some of these things also in relation to that in a lighter way, not laying a trip on myself, but I went, you know, if I'm doing something negative, it could be a lot worse. Like that's not the worst thing to do. And it's also a way to just maintain a little harmony, lightness with my family at times. Like, you know, so again, but noticing the reverberations around a negativity that you're doing. And then can you experiment in your meditation practice, right? is visualize yourself doing the virtue instead. Visualize yourself coming back where you were gonna lie, you were going to lie, where you came back in a constructive way, balanced way, appropriate way with the truth. And what's the result of that? What's the problem with telling the truth in that thing? What's, what's the problem of countering somebody's gossip by just saying, just changing the subject or just floating through something positive about somebody they're talking about negatively. And just, so what you do is that's why we do meditation is we're gonna analytically, you would analytically go through again, the positive of what you're doing. Let's do a meditation right now, the 10 non-virtues, and then we'll talk about the ripening effects. So just sit comfortably. just to show you how this works. 
Just lightly close your eyes. So I'd like you to bring up, of those 10 non-virtues, let me just review. We avoid killing, stealing, sexual misconduct. We avoid lying, divisive speech, harsh speech, gossip. And with our mind, we avoid covetousness or greed, harmful intent, and holding wrong views. I'd like you to just bring one of these up in mind right now, which is one that you tend to stumble with. Just recall this action and when you have performed it, this non-virtue. And I'd like you to have a look around yourself in that situation. If you can put yourself back in a moment, you were performing that negativity. You were engaged in that negativity. Who is around you? How are you feeling? Can you get a sense of what motivated you to engage in the negativity. Have you noticed that you, when you regularly do that negativity or other times you've done it, is it a similar pattern, similar people around or similar feelings in your mind? What could you possibly do differently in this mode that would be according to one of the ethical guidelines? One of the ethical guidelines that opposes this negativity. Get creative if you need to. And right now I'd like you to practice that ethical guideline in relation to the situation. Just see how you can, the first time could be rusty, you don't feel comfortable with it and try to make it more smooth. What you want to do is go back to the beginning of the situation. You keep, again, applying 
the ethical guideline again and again. If it doesn't work in one way, try another way to practice it. Try another way. See how that feels. See the result possibly that may happen. Mainly, how do you feel in your mind? And then what you can do when you have longer time to meditate is you go back again into that negativity more quickly, noting the situation, and then again, practice the ethical guideline. So you're in a sense, planting that seed of some goodness in your mind stream of a better pattern, better behavioral pattern. And in practice on our cushions, we do it again, and again, and again, until that becomes a habitual tendency, that that in relation to another person will suddenly arise automatically. But it takes time to develop that, especially when we have the other habits. So go, go back one more time, noting when you engage in the negativity, applying an alternative, one of the ethical guidelines, how can I oppose this negativity by speaking the truth in an appropriate manner, by saving the life or sanctifying or trying to care for the life, by returning an object I borrowed without asking, on and on, through whichever negativity you're focused on. Please relax, and when you're ready, slowly open your eyes. What you can do in these meditations, the four characteristics of karma, the 10 non-virtues, these are meditations, I do mine a little bit differently, that but they're meditations that come along with the All About Karma Discovering Buddhism course. So when you have more time and you wanna do the whole course, there's corresponding meditations that I would recommend and you can slowly go through those where you learn the 10 non-virtues, which can be really helpful overall. And then you're gonna be working. And then what you would do is in meditation, maybe you go to another non-virtue that you practice a lot and you'd slowly take more time to work on that, to think about why am I doing it? And then the other thing that the meditation practice is helpful for is when you're out about in daily life and something's happening and suddenly you realize you just completely made a mess and you made a mistake and 
said the wrong thing, thought the wrong thing, did the wrong thing, you don't have time to deal with it in your daily life. You're working, you're driving, you're whatever you're doing. So that's why when I come home in my space, that's where I'm going to do the work. And I'll sit down and sometimes you feel kind of forlorn. You come home and you're beaten up and you're like, you know, lousy day, I messed it up. Sit down, some breathing. Hey, you're doing the best you can. Planet's got a lot going on right now, right? A lot of challenges. So be kind to yourself, right? And then just start with my breathing, relax my body, set a motivation. And then I'll have a little look at what, so what happened? Just be gentle. It's a nice space for you to just look at what happened there. I was in the store talking to that person and suddenly I got angry or suddenly I was really, you know, attached to this thing or, you know, confused about something. Then you can look at it and go, oh, yeah, because of this, because of that. Then apply whatever positive other expressions you can have, an antidote or something. You can do some purification or just in the case of the 10 non-virtues. Bring in the ethical conduct. What was it, another response I could have chosen? I had another choice. What was the response? Let me practice it now. Let me practice it again. Let me think about it one more time deeply. Take your time, 15, 20 minutes at least. You know, in there, you're soaking your mind. This is what we do in meditation. I'm not only introducing, I'm then soaking my mind in a certain mindset. Because oh, our mind's soaked in other mindsets, right? Negative mindsets sometimes, negative responses. Well, we're well versed in that. I'm going to soak it in a new mindset over and over until that's what tends to arise in the face of that situation again. And again, please be patient with yourself. This takes time. This is a path that takes effort and time, and most of us are not patient enough. In the States, it's really challenging. People want, wanted their enlightenment two weeks ago wrapped up in a nice little silver box. That's the United States. They're not, you know, it's just not like that. So if you want another, if you want an easy path, find something else. This is not the path, but this path is incredibly worthwhile. Incredibly worthwhile. It does work. I just look at my own mind. It does work. Okay, but it takes time. It takes time. Okay, let me talk about ripening, and then we'll take a break. Four results, how does karma ripen? Like what happens? Why does this karma come up first? Why did this happen first? Why, did, why don't I see the result directly after, after I do something negative? Okay, that's what's intricate. Results of non-virtuous karma. Four results. There's a result that ripens in our rebirth what kind of rebirth we will take. Second is a result that resembles its cause in our experiences. And once we've exhausted the karma to be reborn in a lower realm, we'll have experiences that resemble the original action. And I'm going to explain all this, what this, the original action in a better realm. Okay. Number three, a result that resembles its cause in our actions. Okay, once the karma to take rebirth in the lower realm is exhausted, I tend to repeat that original negative action endlessly. That's the imprint it makes. Fourth is the result ripens in, an, in the environment. You find yourself living in difficult conditions. Okay, so the result that ripens in our rebirth, a lot of sadistic killing, okay? Hell rebirth, we have lower realms. A hell rebirth is one of the worst realms you can land in. And, and unlike Catholicism, we have a variety of hell realms, okay? So you don't only burn to death, but you can freeze to death, like that variety. I don't mean to be glib about it, but however, the difference with Catholicism, this is where I lose all the Catholics in the class, but the difference in from our hell rebirths is um, ours are temporary. Ours are temporary. You, you simply go there based on the mind state that got you there. Sadistic killing. Think about what it does to your mind. Sadistic killing. We've killed stuff. I've stepped on insects by accident. I vacuumed insects with intent. Okay. I didn't, I didn't know it was bad, but, but sadistically, like I'm not into torturing insects. I mean, they were just vacuumed. They were 
you accidentally step on one, you drive over one, you didn't mean to do that. Certainly not, you know, so very different. So um, sadistic killing, though, really a methodical killing like what Hitler was doing, you know, people that enjoy that even more so really frightening. So of course, it's going to land you. So there's the lower rebirth. That's number one, how it could just ripen in a lower rebirth. The other thing is incredible benevolence, incredible benevolence coming out of you can ripen suddenly in a great rebirth, you know, quickly traversing the bardo and just ending up in a great rebirth. Number two, result um, resembles the cause in our experiences. So again, first you take, let's say negative, negative impact, because this is talking about non-virtuous karma, how it ripens. You take a lower rebirth. When you've exhausted what got you into the lower rebirth, that's why they're temporary, the hell realms and the lower realms. You're exhausting karma by the suffering in those rebirths. Once you exhaust that negative karma that got you in there, you rise up. You may not rise directly up the ladder like that in a sequence. Sometimes some other positive karma is there and then you in, in the negative realm for a little bit and then back into a positive realm, right? But once you end up, let's say you end up back in the human realm, which is a good realm, the optimum realm from which to get enlightened, you end up in the positive realm, okay? And then what happens is, let's say you did a lot of killing, whether it was sadistic or not, but you did a lot of killing. What happens with the second result is you end up in this human rebirth, okay? But you get murdered again, right? Or you're in a war-torn country, or you're in a country where medicines don't work. These are all things that shorten life based on killing. Because killing karma gets you where light your life is in danger, your tendency to be killed. The third result that I mentioned resembles its cause in our actions. The first one was resembles our cause in our experiences. I'm experiencing a shortened life, but resembling our cause in our actions means that once I get back into the human rebirth, I have a tendency to kill. Killing feels normal because the imprint is there. Killing feels normal from my side. I end up murdering people again okay. or taking delight or killing insects or things like that. Number four, result ripens in the environment. Sexual misconduct tends to get a ripening result of you're born in a dirty, smelly place. It's kind of dirty sexual misconduct. People are lying to their partners or sneaking around, but somehow in that result is you end up being born in a dirty, you know, I remember um, Rinpoche led a retreat in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil some years ago. And the center asked me to lead the weekend retreat with Rinpoche and, and I went down there and um, I'd never been there before. And there's some really nice places there that they showed us. And then there's the slums, the favelas. And I'd heard about those as well. And we had to drive by them to get to the airport. And I remember going by this kind of vast area and you could see up on the hills like how many people were living there jammed into these areas and it smelled like a sewer so you're living in that day you probably wouldn't even notice the smell when you're living in it but as we drove by it the stench was overwhelming and i remember some of us saying oh you know sexual misconduct result like that being living in that so the ways they can ripen and um okay so i'm just gonna find let me just find my um find my chart here Okay, so for things to ripen again, for an action to be what we call complete, completed karma, um, there have to be components. So again, if you have a really good intention, you accidentally step on an insect, you didn't mean it, you apply, you know, it has a very different ripening effect than intently killing, I'm going to kill this insect, you kill it, you have great joy, very different ripening result, much lesser ripening negative result 
by not having the intention, having great regret after you step on it, doing an antidote like a purification practice like that. So here are these components that make up a completed karma. Number one, you have the basis or the object of the action. Basis or the object of the action. Number two, intention. The intention, what's the mindset? Okay, and the intention has three parts. Recognition, motive, and the delusion, the accompanying delusion. I'm gonna explain all this. And number three, the deed, you do the deed, okay? Actually performing the action, okay? You lie, you kill, you steal, like that. Number four, the completion of the action, and I'll explain what that is. If any of these four factors are missing, the action is not complete, okay? It'll still bring a future suffering result in the face of negative karma, but not as strong as if all four of those deeds are there. Let me give you an example. I'm talking about non-virtues right now. Killing, okay? The basis, number one, number one component, the basis is a living being other than yourself, other than yourself. This is why suicide is a lesser negativity of killing. It's still negative. Suicides, they say, tend to have a tendency to want to suicide again in future lives. There's an imprint, but it's not as heavy completing karma as being a living being other than yourself. Here's the intention with killing. You've got, again, recognition, motive, and delusion. The recognition is you have to unmistakably, unmistakably recognize this is the person I intend to kill. You know who they are. This is the person. The motive is I'm going to kill them. The delusion is usually one of the three poisons, one of the three poisons. So number one, let's take poison number one, fundamental ignorance, this misknowing of reality. So number one, I kill out of, I don't, I'm not really aware that it's bad to kill. Some people have that delusion going on. Some people have, you know, I don't realize the negative tendency. You kill out of anger. What do they call? Killing's a passion. Come home, you find your partner in bed with somebody else, you kill them out of anger. You kill out of attachment, which is also passion. Killing could be. Or because that person has the thing that you want, and you decide to kill them to get that thing. The so different sometimes they're mixed. All three of those are mixed, right? Okay. So then in this delusion, then you have the deed. Then you have the deed. You carry out the killing. Okay, by some means. And they even say either directly you do the killing yourself or indirectly you ask somebody else to do it. It's the same, you get the same karma. So it's very heavy for leaders of countries when they are forced, they decide to go to war or they're forced into war or there's some reason and they make the decision, which is their decision, we're going to war, we're sending troops, we're gonna do it and there's a lot of killing going on, they're gonna get some of that in their own mindset. Okay, again, their intention changes, you know, they, they may have deep regret about anybody dying. They don't, you know, so that's going to change the outcome as well, but there's still going to be some negative killing karma. Okay, number four, completion of killing is the other person or the being dies before you do. This is why suicide also doesn't work because you die at the same time. Okay, so first of all, in suicide, you're not another person. It's yourself and you die at the same time. But the completion of the strong killing karma is the other person, the other being dies before you do like that. Let's look at stealing just to give you some idea of, okay, stealing could be taking what is not given. Okay. The basis is again, something of value belonging to another, something of value. So get the, get the key of value. If it's something they've discarded and you take it less of a negative karma, that's why karma is so intricate. Something of value belonging to another. Here's your intention, number two, your intention. The recognition is I recognize that's the object I'm gonna steal. My motive is I'm going to steal, I intend to steal. The delusion is one of the three poisons. I steal because I want that thing, attachment. I steal because I know it's gonna make the other person upset, so I'm angry at them, I steal. Or I steal because I don't really think I'm stealing. I know they lend me this anyway, so I'm just going to take it. I'm going to borrow the book. You know, I don't need to ask them. Okay. The deed is you steal by whichever means you can. You take the object secretly. You don't pay taxes. 
you don't pay fees, you sneak into the movie, you, what, you know, misusing donations, or you get someone else to steal for you. All of those are the deed. The completion is with stealing, you think that the object now belongs to you. You take ownership of it in your mind. That. Now, here's the things with stealing. But do you understand the four components? How they're ripening? Okay. So here's the thing, a funny thing with stealing. Did you ever go out to a meal and you order your food and you have your entree and whatever it is? And then when you get the bill, you realize they left something off, you know, and you notice that they left something off but you choose not to tell the wait person, the server. That's stealing. That's the kind of stealing we get into. So the nice thing about the ethical conduct is you don't have to make decisions. You just know what to do. Like if the, they left the thing off the bill, I just have to tell the server. Oh, by the way, you, you didn't charge us for the entree. And this is about an entree that you eat and enjoy, not one that you sent back and that they said they'll take it off the bill. Something you eat and enjoy and that's a type of stealing if you notice it. And if you don't notice it, really not, I mean, minor. But once you notice it, and I have a girlfriend, very close friend from childhood, who's always had severe money problems, that never has money, is in debt. It's just a horrible scene for years and years and years. And years ago, I was out to dinner with her, and this exact same thing happened. They left the entree off, and she right away said to me, oh, they didn't charge us all happy. They didn't charge us one of the entrees. And so I said, oh, well, we, and I just immediately, it wasn't even a decision. I said, oh, well, we need to tell the wait person. She said, no, no. Well, so what, you wonder why she doesn't have money. Like, who knows? Maybe it did ripen in this life. But for me, it was just easy. It's like, let's just tell. We ended up telling her. I said, I want to tell her. I'll pay for it. Don't worry about it. I, it just, because when I leave, think about how you feel. Do you feel, do you feel good about it? Now, what happens is, her mind had gotten so tainted with living this way that she felt she was getting away with something that it was when she left, she felt good. But that's how far away her mind is from having an ethical conduct of not taking what isn't offered, you know, but like she just was so far from it that she was always looking to kind of short people and get away with something and it ends up coming up, but she's just continual money problems. So maybe it came in from another life. Maybe she's experiencing the result in this life. I can't say. Yeah, but it makes it easier where you just know I need to do the right guideline. Okay. Sexual misconduct. A basis. For lay people, because monastics can't have sex, for lay people, a basis could actually be, I know this may get some of you a little, you know, upset with, a basis with sexual misconduct could be, honestly, they do talk about this in the scriptures, an improper orifice of the body that you're having sex with, an improper time of the day you're having sex with, improper place, you know, not to have sex around spiritual pictures, images, statues an improper partner in the case of sexual misconduct. For ordained people, any kind of sexual activity is technically sexual misconduct. Now, the reason you might say, what do you mean a prop, an improper orifice? What do you mean an improper time of day? And a lot of this was to counter desire, it's to counter desire. Because, and honestly, you know, I wasn't always a nun. I had partners and, and I did notice that over time, the more creative you might get, the more intricate and how, and then my mind started circling around desire more and more because I was doing it more and more. When, when that kind of subsided and I became a nun and wasn't interested, I don't really think about it. Now you could say, well, it's aging as well, of course, but I could just see that even as a lay person, when I was allowed to have sex and things like that, when I wasn't doing it that much and living in Asia and living around communities of nuns or, or women or monastics or whatever, I, my mind wasn't going there. The habit wasn't there, so I, I didn't want to engage as much when I was doing it more and in those environments and around friends that were all engaged in it that then there was more talk about it more thinking about it. A little bit so again just look at the imprints look at the imprints it's not about keeping you in a prison or a box it's not about you can do you can't do it's you and responsibility with your mind that's what we're talking about. 
Let's look at the intention, sexual misconduct, recognition. You're no doubt that you're going to have an act of sexual misconduct. That's what I'm going to do. The unmistaken recognition of the object I'm going to engage with, the person I want to engage in, the act that I'm going to do. Okay. The motive I intend to engage in this, in this act. Okay. The delusion, again, one of the three poisons. So I'm doing it because I really want that person out of attachment, right? Out of anger at their partner. I want to get back at their partner, make them jealous you know, or just misknowing ignorance. You know, I don't really think it's that big of a deal. I don't see it with sexual misconduct. So we just do it, you know, this time it's not going to do anything. The deed is actually technically when the two organs come into contact, whichever organs they are when come into contact could be male, male, female, female, male, female, doesn't matter. The completion is you have an orgasm. Completion of the real sexual misconduct, you experience the bliss of orgasm. So again, if that doesn't happen, a little bit lesser degree than of the negativity. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to take a break right now. What I'd like you to do, I'd like you to think about the next seven of the ethical guidelines and the non-virtues. Just think about the basis, intention, the deed, the completion, and just see if you can figure out lying. Like what would be the basis in lying? Um, what's the intention in lying? What do I have to do to lie? What actually is the deed that I'm going to do? And what's the completion of lying? What's the completion of dis divisive speech, harsh speech, gossip, those things? See if you can layer a little bit. And we're going to come back and talk about the, um, uh, is it fate or is it karma? Is it fate? Is it karma? We're going to do Vajrasafa practice. And we're going to talk about some of throwing karma, completing karma, the heaviness based on the object, things like that. So spend a little time in the next hour, if you can, keeping the mind a little bit more focused on karma and what we've talked about this morning. And then we will be back at um, one o'clock. Does that sound good? Okay. And let's just dedicate whatever merit we've created from this morning. Thank you so much for your attention. Uh, let's dedicate whatever positive energy we've created to helping us have a better understanding of karma so we can work on gently cleaning up our body, speech, and mind in an appropriate, realistic way for us so that we can have happier and happier experiences in the future, moving us along this path to enlightenment so we can really benefit all living beings. Thank you so much and see you soon. See you soon on the moon, as Lama Yeshi used to say.